Hello everyone, welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another audiobook. Now, this one's a bit late. Uh, I apologize for that. It's because I haven't been able to get a hold of the book as quickly. But today we are reading the first story of Blackbird, which is the sixth Fazbear Frights book. Uh, and this is the first story called Blackbird itself. I'm so excited to read this. Um, I hope it won't be too, too long. And I also hope that it, it has some lore reveals in here. But um, without further ado, again, as with every single audiobook that I record, this is my reaction to it as well as my reading of it. So first of all, I am going to be a bit stumbly when I read it. Um, there are going to be a few words that I stumble on. I apologize for that. But at least you'll be able to react to the book along with me. So I think we should begin. Blackbird. It needs to be bloody. Noel sat backward on his chair, its straight back between his splayed legs. In spite of the chair's cheap tan plastic and the rest of the room's less than upscale ambience, Noel managed to look cool and confident. Sam wondered how he pulled that off so easily. Feeling like the nerd that he was, Sam tried to adjust his long legs to fit another of the cheap plastic chairs. He disagreed with Noel. Horror's not in the blood, it's in the creepy factor. Oh, sorry, creep factor. <laughs> creep factor? Noel repeated. It's a technical term. Noel nodded. I must have dozed off when Grimley was talking about that. More likely you were staring at Darla Stewart. You make a point. And we're not getting anywhere. Sam sighed and shifted in his seat again. His legs were cramping. He was hungry. And he was pretty sure he and Noel were the only pair in the room who hadn't come up with an idea yet. Although Sam's back was to the rest of the space, he could hear the jumble of eight hushed conversations going on all over the grade wall room. The classroom had little to muffle the intense babble, a few folding tables, some plastic chairs, a portable closet packed with sound equipment, and a viewing screen. Through an open door behind Noel, Sam could see the project room, which had open space for filming scenes, a green screen, and several shelves stuffed full of more AV equipment. The conversations between Sam's classmates were mostly incomprehensible because they were taking place in cautious whispers and mumbles, lest a brilliant idea get stolen. Occasionally, though, someone would get excited and Sam could make out a word. Serial, killer, uh, zombie, vampire, demon. The words he heard drained some of the tension from his shoulders. If those were the other team's ideas, maybe he and Noel still had a chance. They didn't have an idea yet, but at least they didn't have to, they didn't have a done to death idea. You have to admit, she has a fine caboose, Noel said. Sam stretched all thirty seven inches of his legs and stared at his huge feet. Both Sam's legs and his feet defied the normal proportions that should have gone with his six foot five body. Oh, six foot five. Damn. <laughs> According to a chart his doctor showed him once, his legs should have been about 34 and a half inches long. You wouldn't think two and a half extra inches would be much, but apparently they were enough to make Sam look like a stork or a heron or a crane. He heard all three from various unkind kids. And those inches were enough to make him prone to grand displays of ungainly clumsiness, which prevented him from turning his height into something useful, like, say, on a basketball course. All Sam's legs did, as far as he could tell, was get in his way. Earth to Sam. Huh? Looks like we're lagging here, dude. Noel gestured out of the room, out into the room behind Sam's shoulders. Sam looked around. Four teams were leaving the room. Two were getting ready to leave. Only two other teams were still talking. Great. Actually, it was kind of great. Sam thought better in silence. He looked at his watch. The classroom was open for another half hour. They had 30 minutes to come up with something. Would you get out of that chair? Noel flung his foot out and kicked the side of Sam's seat. You're squirming so much you remind me of my nephew when he needs to take a piss. I can't get comfortable. My heart bleeds. There you go with the blood again. Noel grinned. It's all about the blood. Seriously, we need to think. Hey! Noel's bl blasé? Bla I don't know. Noel's posture disappeared. 
He glanced over the remaining teams. Seriously, dude, get off the chair. Come over here. Noel exited his chair with enviable grace. And he... Oh, enviable. (laughs) Sorry. Again, just a reminder, I am going to mess up a lot of words. I'm not the the reading professor... uh, Connoisseur, connoisseur. I'm not the reading connoisseur. He exited his chair with enviable grace, and he took a couple of steps to the wall behind him. Sliding down the wall, he folded his normal length legs, perfectly proportioned for his six foot one height, into a meditative position. He motioned to Sam again when Sam hesitated. So Sam gave up on the too too small chair and awkwardly put his skinny body on the floor in front of Noel. He had to admit his legs were happier. Noel leaned forward and spoke softly. Do you remember Freddy Fazbear's pizza? Here we go. Noel's breath smelled like licorice. Sam leaned away. Sure. Why? Noel lowered his voice into a whisper so faint Sam had trouble understanding him. All he heard was creepy animat. But that was enough. Oh, those. Sam felt goosebumps on his arms. He was glad he was wearing a long-sleeved t-shirt so Sam wouldn't see how the mention of the characters affected him. Yeah, those were some... Those were creepy, all right. Thinking about pizza gave me the idea, Noel said. What idea? Noel gazed out over the classroom again. Sam checked it too. Only one other team was left. It was the infamous Darla, her fine caboose, and her friend, Amber, who actually was the nice one of the two girls. They had their heads together, and they seemed to be having a whispered disagreement. They weren't paying any attention to Noel and Sam. My idea is to write a horror story plot around a creepy animatronic of our own, Noel whispered to Sam. Ooh. Sam, edgy from just thinking about Freddy Fazbear's uh, animatronic characters, had to admit that was a great idea. I like it. Awesome. Noel held out a fist, and Sam bumped it. So what would be a good character? Noel asked. You're asking me? You're the genius. Sam wasn't a genius, but he did get good grades. Some people, like Noel, who tended to be a bit of a screw-off, got those things confused. Sam leaned back and and looked at his feet again. A good animatronic character. A good animatronic character. A good animatronic... Sam looked at his legs. Stork, heron, crane. How about a bird? Not a chick, obviously. Something more obviously intimidating. That's not bad. How about a goose? A goose? Sam repeated loudly. He laughed. Don't laugh. A goose attacked me when I was little. I still bear the scars. Seriously? Noel pulled up a left leg of his faded jeans. He pointed at a white scar below his knee. It bit you? Well, no, it chased me while I was on my bike. I fell off my bike and cut my knee. Sam laughed again. Noel dropped his pant leg. Sorry, Sam said. I can see you're traumatised. Noel stared blankly into the middle distance. You have no idea. I probably need therapy. I don't think I want to do a horror film about an animatronic goose, (laughs) Sam said. You're right. We need the creep factor. What a creepy bird. You guys win the rotten egg prize, Amber called from across the room. Saving the best for last, Noel said, holding his clasped hands above his head in a victory gesture. Amber laughed. You're an idiot. Darla said nothing, and the two girls left the room, talking about a poetry reading for their English class. She likes you, Sam said. She thinks I'm an idiot. So she likes you, and she knows you. No kick to Sam's foot. Sam returned to the problem. Oh, I've got it. He sat up and said in a solemn, ominous tone. Once upon a midnight dreary, huh? Oh, come on, you're not that much of an idiot. I might be. Quoth the raven. I think that's how you pronounce it. Sam prompted. Huh? Oh, wait, I know this. That poem by the scary dude. Poe. Oh, a raven. Yeah. Oh, only... No, not quite. The raven, obviously, is a cliché. A crow would be two. I'm thinking of a blackbird. It has the same connotation, but blackbirds are a little smaller. They're songbirds, and we actually have more of them in our area than we do crows or ravens. How do you know this stuff? I'm a genius, remember? No, I'd forgotten, because I'm an idiot. They both laughed. Okay, so we've got a creepy blackbird, Noel said. Now what? Ever had one of them stare at you? Sam asked. 
I mean, really stare at you. There was this there was one in the quad the other day. I was thinking about skipping Psych 201, and that bird kept looking at me, and I felt so guilty. I and I felt so guilty. I went to class. Sam snapped his fingers. That's dumb, but I think you're onto something. What? Guilt? Idiot here, remember? You have to smell it. Sp- smell it? Spell it out. Our animatronic, the Blackbird, Sam gave the name finger quotes, will get you to confess your darker secrets, and then when you do, it comes to punish you for your sins. It never lets you off the hook, never let- lets you rest. We can have the Blackbird basically hound some poor dude to death. Will there be blood? Noel asked. You're a ghoul. Sam chewed on his lower lip. Actually, a little blood might not be bad. If you prick us, do we not do we not bleed? I don't know why I keep trying to say breed or something else. (laughs) Wow, Sam said. You're quoting Shakespeare? Maybe your idiot thing is all an act. I'll never tell. The blackbird will make you tell, (laughs) Sam said with a wicked laugh. I like where this is going so far. I like where this is going. Sam and Noel finally finished plotting the movie just in time for the next class. Even though he was arguably too tall for the role, Sam thought it would be fun to play the blackbird. Noel, who honestly didn't want to dress up like a bird, said Sam's size would make the blackbird even scarier. That left Noel with the part of the poor, beleaguered, (laughs) guilty guy. I can do pathetic, Noel said proudly later that day as they shared a pizza. That you can. Sam agreed. When Noel and Sam were only halfway through their pepperoni and jalapeno pizza, Amber came through the brick-walled restaurant and spotted them. Do you have room for one more? She pointed at the black vinyl booth seat Noel sat on. Noel scooted over. Sure, but keep your mitts off our pizza. I don't want your stinking pizza, Amber said. Sam grinned at Amber as she flagged down a server and ordered a soda. So, what's your movie about? She asked. Wouldn't you like to know? Noel said, eyes narrowed in suspicion. Amber sniffed. As if. I was just making conversation. What's yours about? It's about knitting, her smirk said. She was feeling pretty good about her project. Are you serious? Noel asked. Absolutely. Will there be blood? Noel asked. (laughs) Sam laughed and shook his head. Plenty, Amber said. Noel pointed at Sam. See? Must have blood. Sam ignored him. The pizza place was crowded and noisy. Above the smells of spicy pepperoni, sausage, and tomato sauce, the small space thrummed with the beat of classic rock coming from overhead speakers. Sam waved to a few friends, then watched Amber watch Noel. Sam wasn't sure why Noel didn't ask Amber out. She was cute, not Sam's type. The few girls he'd gone out with were taller and more serious than Amber. But Noel, Noel liked girls he could laugh with. And girls seemed to like Noel's blue eyes, athlete's body, and scruffy blonde hair. Amber, also blonde, blue-eyed, and in good shape, looked good sitting next to Noel. She even dressed like he did, usually wearing faded jeans, white shirts, and, when the weather allowed it, leather jackets. Classic. Uh, Sam blinked when Amber leaned across the table, blowing the paper wrapping off the end of her straw and towards his face. He told me your movie is about a bird. I think he's lying. Sam smiled. Actually, he's not. You mean like, the birds? Nor snorted and waved a slice of pizza around. We're not that derivative. Oh, big word, Amber said. Sam laughed. Actually, they were being a bit derivative, weren't they? Is that how? Derivative, yeah. (laughs) Sorry, they were piggybacking off the Freddy Fazbear's pizza. The hair on the back of Sam's neck prickled. Why did they? Why did that happen every time he thought of the place? Sam pulled out his wallet and threw some cash on the table. I need to go get started. On what? Amber asked. We'll never tell, Noel said. Amber smacked his arm. Ah, Sam thought. True love. <laughs> Many of Sam's classmates thought it was pathetic that he lived at home. But he loved it. First, he got along great with his parents, who were supportive and fun. Second, he had way more privacy and space than he'd have in a dorm. His parents had remodelled the basement into a sprawling apartment for him with his own kitchenette, bathroom, sleeping area and space for his film projects. 
and third, he liked getting away from the campus at the end of the day. He could only take so much of the constant chatter, scholastic and social angst, and the frantic place, and the pace. Sorry.、Um, besides, he had no use for partying. Working on his projects were more fun than drinking and acting like a moron. Sam's house was about two miles from the college, an easy distance to walk, which was good since he didn't have a car. He enjoyed the walk home too. It followed the railroad tracks that ran along the top of a steep. Forested drop-off into a rocky trench and culvert that separated farmland from the college's expansive acreage. There's so many big words. <laughs> Sam liked to pretend he was an old-timey vagabond strolling along, waiting to hop a train to travel to faraway adventures. In fact, Sam was working on a screenplay about freight hoppers set in the mid 20th century. He knew it was a tough lifestyle, but it held romantic appeal for him. Maybe because he had never felt like he had fit in with mainstream life. And of course, his current project wasn't going to help with that. Three days after Sam and Noel decided on their horror movie plot, Sam, Sam sat in his special orders desk chair his mum had gotten for him, at the huge craft table in the basement. Covering the pale blonde wood table were piles and piles of long black feathers. Luckily, Sam's dad was a merchandiser who had gift for finding rare items. He could locate pretty much anything Sam ever needed for his projects. Today, his dad had met Sam in the driveway with several crates of feathers, which he'd helped Sam transport down the basement stairs. Before leaving the basement, Sam's dad sang out, "Bye bye, blackbird." Very funny, Dad. Sam called up the stairs. He smiled at the answering chuckle and began pulling feathers from the crates. Sam's idea for the blackbird costume was to weave long black feathers into a netted black fabric that would then be sewn onto a black body hugging suit, like a feathered body wrap. Oh no, wrap! I never said that.、Uh, <laughs> this was going to require a lot of feather placing, a fixing, and sewing. So Sam queued up some bluesy jazz. And got to work. At 11:30 p.m., Sam startled when the phone rang. It was Noel. Amber asked me out. Good. I thought I was supposed to be doing the asking out. Have you ever heard of women's lib? Vaguely, but I come from a family of male chauvinists. <laughs> I'm still in the nerving in the learning curve. What did you say to her? Sam winced, stabbing his finger with a needle for the hundredth time. I said yes. I couldn't think fast enough to say anything else. Besides, I've decided her caboose might be as fine as Darla's. That's important. How's the costume coming? Good, I think. I should have done it by tomorrow afternoon, and we can work on the set. Which is a tragedy. Noel complained. The set? No, working on it tomorrow. Tomorrow is a Saturday. <laughs> Saturdays are for frolicking. It's the only time we could get the shooting studio assigned to us. Sam reminded him. A pity. Sam ignored him, hung up the phone, and returned to sewing feathers. A few hours later, he put the finishing touches on the costume, attaching to the head two beady yellow and black eyes, and a tiny pointed orange beak. Even though he was exhausted, he donned the suit and stood in front of the full-length mirror behind the bathroom door. Sam nearly shrieked when he saw himself, because what he was doing, what he was looking at, wasn't him anymore. It was so not him. He. Was tempted to tear off the suit and find himself again. He felt like his creation had assimilated him. He'd been transformed. He couldn't see any part of Sam. All he saw was a monster-sized blackbird. His design had come out just how he envisioned it. The oversized proportions made the made the suit look almost kid-friendly, but the wide, dead eyes and dripping midnight feathers were deeply unsettling. He had no doubt that poor Floyd, the character in their movie, would seriously regret his dark secrets when he came face to face with the blackbird. Thanks to the massive quantity of feathers his dad got for him, Sam had been able to approximate the full belly shape of a blackbird. He'd fashioned the curve of the belly to come all the way down to below his knees, so the bird's legs start started at his shins, conveying realistic proportions. His mum had helped him 
with the feet part of the costume. His mum, who loved all things crafty, found a pair of stretch-to-fit water shoes and an extra large... Uh, an extra extra large, sorry, gotta emphasize the extra large, extra extra large black tights with a scales pattern. She also showed Sam how to shape the bird toes out of black rubber into which he then carved deep grooves. Together, they used sculpting epoxy to create bird claws, which Sam inserted into the rubber toes. He attached the bird feet to the water shoe so it looked like the toes extended out naturally. At first glance, Sam was a huge blackbird, and he was beyond creepy. Now they just needed a little blood. Sam laughed. Maybe then Noel would shut up about the blood. Noel and Sam met Saturday afternoon to design their movie set. Noel would rather have been playing volleyball with his fraternity brothers, but in spite of his nonchalant um, posturing, film class mattered to him. Plus, he was stoked about their movie. When Noel arrived in the shooting studio, Sam immediately showed him a picture of the blackbird suit. Noel was glad Sam wasn't looking at him when Noel first saw the picture. He was pretty sure he went pale. It felt like he had gone pale. He'd suddenly gotten cold and weak and shaky. What the heck was happening? When Sam turned to ask Noel what he thought, Noel bent over and pretended to tie his shoe. It's rad. Above and beyond, dude. Yeah? Thanks. I kind of freaked myself out when I looked in the mirror, Sam said. Noel rose, pretty sure his normal colouring was back. Leave it to Sam to admit that he was freaked out. Sam had no clue how to be cool. He was too honest, too open and too himself to get within sniffing distance of cool. Okay, so we're thinking bedroom, right? Sam stood in the middle of the set. Nightmares. Night terrors. Cold sweats, paranoid self-defense, panicked phone calls. Yep, I think it's the ultimate in a film for a one-room set. Noel pretended to speak into a megaphone. Step right up, folks. Get all your creep factor right here. One-stop shopping. Sam laughed. Noel grinned. Sam wasn't bad looking when he laughed. Noel thought. Sam's problem was that he always looked so serious. With strong features, a wide mouth, and a sharp jawline, Sam usually came across as harsh and angry, even when he wasn't. His face was like one of those carvings on totem poles. That's so mean! (laughs) In fact, when Noel had met Sam at the beginning of the semester the previous year, he'd asked Sam if he was a totem pole. What? (laughs) The dude was so tall, and he wore a lot of black, red, and tan. Do I have something on my face? Sam asked. Just your ugly mug. Noel gave Sam a playful punch to let Sam know he was kidding. Come on, man. Sam tossed to Noel a screwdriver. Let's get to work. Over the le- uh, sorry. Over the next two hours, they built, they built furniture, hung pictures, made the bed, and argued about which personal and decor items went where and why. Sam seemed to have a particularly entrenched opinion about dirty socks. This movie is about airing your dirty laundry and what happens to you when you do. The dirty silk should have a prominent place in the visual narrative, not just to be tossed off to the side, Sam said. Noel held up his hands. I give. After another half hour, Noel was getting bored. So, Sam, what dark secrets could the blackbird get out of you? Sam dropped the stack of magazines he was carrying. Noel laughed. (laughs) Guilt much? Sam shook his head. Coincidence. Uh Uh-huh. Noel looked at Sam. Well, I don't have any dark secrets, Sam said. The way he industriously cleaned up the magazines made Noel think Sam was hiding something. Come on, dude, spill. Noel laughed. The secrets, not the magazines. Sam finished restacking the magazines and he straightened. He looked down at Noel. Nothing to spill. What about you? Sam really is a nerd, Noel thought. He wasn't the kind of guy Noel usually hung out with. But Sam was a genius in film class. Always hitch your wagon to the best horse, Noel's grandfather used to say. Noel's grandfather was a multi-millionaire. Noel figured taking his grandfather's advice was pretty wise. Okay, Noel conceded. I'll tell you mine. He threw himself on the bed and put his hands behind his head. Hey, Sam said. Shoes. 
I borrowed that bread spread. Bed spread, sorry. Fine, Mum. Noel kicked off his shoes. Sam ignored him and started hanging curtains over a fake window. So, I'm not proud of this, Noel said. But was that true? Might it be possible, if he really was telling the truth about his dark secret, that he was a little proud of it? If it's a dark secret, I don't know why you would be proud of it, Sam said. Okay, whatever. So when I was in junior high... Uh, sorry, I was going to say high school. <laughs> so when I was in junior high, I would have been maybe 12 or so, I guess. I was a bully. Sam turned around and gave Noel a long look. What do you mean? Sam asked. You know, a bully. Noel chuckled. A pretty ruthless bully, actually. Give me an example, Sam said. What was wrong with Sam's voice? It sounded, it sounded stiff. Noel looked up at the ceiling and thought back. Well, you know, the usual. Basically, I called them as I saw them. Sam leaned against the wall and stared at Noel. I still don't get it. Noel sat up in the bed. Okay, so there was this really awkward fat girl. She had all these weirdo habits and like she wouldn't look at you in the eye and she was always squeezing her hands together and she had trouble talking. She didn't stutter, but she seemed to have trouble figuring out how to talk. She was just weird. She had funny facial expressions and she wore the stupidest clothes I've ever seen. I mean, it looked like she did all her shopping at thrift, sh at thrift stores, not the cool ones. All of these sentences are tongue twisters, I swear. Her clothes never matched and stuff, so I started calling her second hand, SH for short, and when she'd walk down the hall I'd go, shh. It caught on and pretty soon everyone was doing it. Noel laughed. That was a riot. Stuff like that. Oh, and then one time she came to school wearing these high water pants. I mean, she looked so stupid, so her friends and I threw water in her face. Get it? High water? Noel laughed. And he wore, and she wore these thick glasses and always looked like she was squinting to find her way. So I put a dead mole in her locker and asked if she was grieving her best friend. Noel guffawed. Sometimes he'd just cracked himself up. He looked at Sam. Sam wasn't laughing. Sam pulled out the chair they'd placed in front of the desk in Floyd's room. You really think that stuff is funny? Sam asked. Well, yeah, Noel said. Don't you? You have to admit it's clever stuff, right? Like, there was this time I got a bucket full of burrs that took a while to do too. It's not easy gathering burrs. But, see, the girl's name was Christine Wilbur. I remember her name because of the burr ending. And she had this long, sting stringy hair that she never washed enough. So I figured I'd do burrs for Christine Wilbur. Get it? Burrs for Wilbur? It was actually an experiment. I wanted to see if burrs would stick to greasy hair. Of course, I had to have a control, so when I threw the burrs, I also threw them at her friend, Valerie. Valerie had frizzy hair, and I'm pretty sure she washed it too much. And sure enough, the burrs stuck better on Valerie than they did on Christine. I'll never forget them standing there outside the school like a couple monkeys picking lice off each other, trying to get those burrs out of their hair. Now, that was funny. Noel laughed. Sam shook his head. That's not funny. Noel raised an eyebrow, but didn't stop laughing. Seriously? Picture it. They're like two little monkeys. He pretended to be a monkey, picking lice off another monkey. Sam frowned, stood up, and started pacing around the fake room. Noel leaned back on the bed again. He pulled out a pillow from under the bedspread and plumped it up. I just made that bed, Sam snapped. Chill, I'll fix it when I get up. Sam kept pacing. He then abruptly stopped. Unless you're behind... You have to have noticed I'm not a normal looking guy, right? Noel tilted his head. You're tall, but so are a lot of my frat brother brothers. They're tall and athletic, Sam said. I'm just tall. Okay. So when I was in junior high, I was already way too tall for my age, and my legs looked even longer than they do now because I was so skinny. So guess what happened to me? Noel figured Sam was bullied, but he decided to wait and let Sam tell his story. Noel knew he could be an idiot, but he wasn't stupid. I was bullied basically from the time I entered first grade until I got to my freshman year in high school. Then that year, well, that year, it stopped. But I can tell you that those jokes you think are so funny, they're not funny to the people on the receiving end of them. Sam crossed his arms and glared at Noel. Noel laughed. 
Dude, you look so like a totem pole right now. Or no, you look like one of those wooden Indian statues. Noel sat up, crossed his arms, and intoned, How? No. <laughs> Noel fell back on his bed and laughed. Sam shook his head and turned around. And that's offensive. Let's just get this done, huh? Noel got off the bed. Still grinning, he, re he remade the bed. Maybe not as neatly as Sam had done it, but it was made. And who said Floyd was compulsive about his bed anyway? Are you okay, dude? Noel asked. Sam was keeping his back to Noel. I'm good. Sam turned around and surveyed the room, not looking at Noel. I think we're done here. How about if we call it good for now, and I'll bring my costume from home tomorrow so we can start filming? You don't want to run through the lines now? You're the one who has the lines. I thought you said you already knew them. I do. Well, then I'd say we're done. Sam stepped over to the bed and fixed Noel's messy bed-making job. Okay, chemo Sabe. What? <laughs> um, okay. Noel chuckled. Sam flicked Noel a look, said, see you tomorrow, and strode out of the shooting studio. I might have gone on one of that big dude's old... On the, oh my gosh, I'm so bad at reading. I might have gotten on one of that dude's big old nerves, Noel said to himself. Then he chuckled again. He did crack himself up. Returning from his date that evening with Amber, Noel sauntered down the hall to his single room in the frat house, bobbing his head in time to the music that vibrated the walls. The speakers were on the first floor, and this was the third. But his frat br brothers were partying hard tonight. The whole house shook. It also smelled like beer, knockwurst, and unwashed laundry. He wrinkled his nose. Noel didn't mind the noise, but he didn't love the smell. Noel wouldn't have admitted to anyone, but he wasn't really fraternity material. He p he'd pledged this frat because his dad and granddad had been members, and it had been assumed he'd be one too. But it was a cool frat, and Noel was all about doing what it took to be cool. So he was content, especially since he'd won the room lottery, uh, since he'd won the room lottery at the beginning of the year, which got him the best single room in the three-storey Tudor mansion that housed the frat. The door Noel was strolling past flew open, and a muscular, rumpled guy with spiky black hair scratched his bare belly and squinted up at the bright hall lights. What time is it? he asked. Almost midnight, Noel said. You okay, Ian? Ian was a football player, a dedicated one. He was always talking about treating his body as a temple and stuff like that. He liked to walk around in his boxer shorts, showing everyone just what an awesome temple it was. Noel thought Ian was a little full of himself, but he did find the guy's boxer shorts amusing. He had dozens of them, all in different colours and patterns. Tonight's boxers were white, but they were covered in bright yellow rubber ducks. Maybe it was the rubber ducks that made Noel notice Ian's grey clay-like complexion and the dark smudges under his, ear, uh, under his eyes. You don't expect someone wearing rubber ducks to look like they're terminally ill. Not, st not sleeping lately, and now this. Ian waved a hand at the throbbing beat that still massa um, massaged? Yeah, I I'll go with massaged. It still massaged the walls of the building. The music keeps you awake? Yeah, doesn't it keep you awake? Nah, nothing keeps me awake. Seriously? Seriously, I can sleep through pretty much anything. I'm envious. I have trouble sleeping every night. Must have a guilty conscience, Noel said. Ian's eyes widened. What? Chill, just kidding, Noel laughed and punched Ian on the cement he called an upper arm. Ian gave Noel a weak smile and stumbled across the hall to the bathroom. Noel rubbed his knuckles and headed down the hall to his room. Noel arrived back at the shooting, shooting studio at noon the next day, even though it was a Sunday, and he generally spent his Sundays watching sports on TV or playing in, intramural ball with his frat brothers. He figured he should get to the studio on time to mend things with Sam. Even though Sam hadn't said much, he was clearly pretty upset the day before. Noel must have pushed it a little too far. He knew he sometimes did that. When Noel discovered Sam wasn't in the studio yet, he stretched out on the bed to wait. Forty-five minutes later, he was still lying there. He closed his eyes and must have fallen asleep, because when Amber charged in the room, he was so startled he almost fell out of the bed. Did you hear? Huh? He sat up. Hear what? 
He rubbed his face. What time is it? It's 2.30. The news about Sam. What news about Sam? Amber hugged herself. They think he might have been hit by a train. Oh God. She brushed at her puffy eyes. What? Apparently he made a costume for your movie. The one with black feathers. And they found feathers all over the tracks for like two miles. All over the place. Noel shot off the bed. Is he okay? Amber shook her head. That's the thing. They don't know. He's gone missing. I've got to go. Noel charged past Amber and tore out of the film studies building. That escalated quickly. <laughs> the railroad tracks ran along the back side of the campus, behind the cafeteria, recording centre and swimming pool complex. They were about a half mile from the film studies building, jogging past kids throwing frisbee in the squad and others studying in the shade of the campus's big cheddar... Is it... Oh no, how do you say that? Cheddar? Cheddar? I'm going to say cheddar. I know it's probably not cheddar, but... <laughs> of the campus's big trees. Noel ignored several greetings and concentrated on getting to the tracks. Hit by a train? Missing? Noel couldn't believe it. When Noel reached the tracks, his stomach clenched at the sight of a half dozen cop cars pulled up alongside the tracks and doubled that number of cops walking the area, their gazes to the ground. Pushing into the relatively docile crowd, uh, hanging out behind crime scene tape guarded by a large, balding cop, Noel approached the cop and said, I'm Sam's friend. Have you found him yet? Who are you? The cop asked. Sam's friend, Noel repeated. Noel Markham. Noel saw no reason to keep his name a secret. He hadn't done anything wrong, had he? You know something about what happened here? The cop asked. I only know what a friend told me, that because of the feathers you think Sam was hit by a train and you couldn't find him. The cop eyed him. Could the guy have been more of a cliché? Big gut, shiny head surrounded by a black fringe of hair. Dark eyes squinted to try and intimidate Noel. Thick hands resting on his gun belt. The cop could have walked off a TV set. Except, this cop smelled like hair gel and cheap cologne. At least, TV cops were unscented. Noel eyed the cop right back. If you don't have something to tell us, the cop said, toying with his nightstick, get back there with everyone else. Noel didn't move. He, le he leaned to his right to see past the cop. Even from there, he could see black feathers fluttering over the tracks. The cop shifted his stance, and that's when Noel noticed the tall couple standing between one of the police cars and a bright red Chevy Suburban. They were talking with the guy in a baggy suit. Noel bit the inside of his cheek so he wouldn't groan loud. Those were Sam's parents, Paul and Molly O'Neill. He'd met them when, he, when they threw a party to celebrate the previous semester's completed film projects. Really nice people. Both were tall and dark like Sam although Sam's mum wasn't as tall. She was almost as tall as Noel, though. Hefty, too. If there was something called Mum League in the NFL, she could have played. Call me Molly, she'd said when Noel had met her. Mrs O'Neill is my mother-in-law. Noel remembered Molly had a great smile and an even better laugh. Right now, she wasn't laughing. She was crying. Her head pressed against her husband's shoulder. Noel clenched his fists in frustration. How could he help? Molly looked up and, he, and she spotted Noel. Noel, is that you? The cop standing with Sam's parents motioned, motioned for the TV cop to net Lowell Pat. Oh my gosh. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm messing up again. <laughs> for the TV cop to let Noel pass. Noel couldn't stop himself from giving the cop a smirk as he went past, but his smirk died a quick death when he saw Molly's pinched white face. She rushed to Noel and threw her arms around him. You heard? Oh, Noel, he's missing, but they say he probably couldn't have survived. Her voice broke, and she turned back toward Paul. Paul held Molly with one arm, and offered his other hand for Noel to shake. Holding Molly close, Paul said, because of the way the feathers of his costume are scattered, they think he was probably grazed by the train and then thrown clear, but they haven't found him. Noel frowned and watched a black feather scuttle over the ground near the rails. That's when he noticed blood on the rail on the opposite side of the tracks. Not a lot of blood, just one smear, but it was a big smear. 
a police officer was taking a picture of it. Blood, Noel thought. There had to be blood, he kept telling Sam. Oh my gosh. Noel lingered by the tracks with Sam's distraught parents the rest of the afternoon. By then, the police had declared Sam missing, presumed dead. Multiple search parties had been sent out. Noel had even been part of one, but no one found anything. When Noel left the tracks to return to his room, he let Molly and Paul hug him, even though he didn't want to be hugged. Being near them was like standing next to a loudspeaker for emotions. Their grief was amplified by their facial expressions and memories about Sam. The clamorous sense of loss was more than Noel could handle. He couldn't stand to be around Molly and the cops anymore. He had to get away. Once Noel started walking away from the scene at the tracks, he couldn't stop. He just couldn't process what had happened. How could Sam be dead? Was it my fault? What? Why do you think that? He didn't do anything. But that isn't true, is it? He kind of did do something. He'd been a bit of a jackass the day before, and Sam had been upset. He tried to hide it, but Noel could tell Sam was pissed when he left the studio. So what if being upset had made him careless? But it happened this morning, not last night, he told himself. Sam wouldn't have still been upset this morning, right? Noel wasn't convincing himself. Why did he have to be such a jerk sometimes? Yo, Noel, go long. Noel looked up to see one of his intramural buddies holding a football and pointing. Noel trotted in the direction indicated and caught a somewhat wobbly spiral after juggling it a couple of times. He was about to throw it back, intending to return it in an upstaging perfect spiral, but his gaze, as he brought his arm forward, landed on a large black shape just at the edge of the trees. Noel let go of the ball, and it flopped all over the place before landing 50 feet short of its target. Worse, Noel's friend called. Noel ignored him. What had he just seen? Noel continued to ignore his friend, who was now shouting comments about Noel's throwing ability. Noel hadn't seen what he thought he'd seen, had he? When Noel reached the trees, he looked up into the sagging branches and then down into the tangled underbrush. He saw nothing out of the ordinary. It must have been his imagination, all that talk of black feathers in Sam's costume. It was messing with his head. A little after six, Noel's stomach came unclenched enough to remind him that he hadn't eaten but since before he'd gone to the shooting studio. He needed food. So he headed to the cafeteria. Not much of what was served there could be called food, but he was hungry enough to eat pretty much anything at this point. The cafeteria was only half full, as was usual on Sundays. A lot of students went away for the weekends, and even more ate out. Usually only the nerds were around about now. Hey, Noel didn't have to turn to identify the speaker. It was Amber. He wasn't sure what to say to her. Their last exchange felt like years ago. She must have come looking for an update about Sam. Noel turned. Hey? I, um, never see you here on Sundays. Noel let out a sigh of relief at the slight hint of sarcasm she managed to slide into pretty much everything that came out of her mouth, even when sarcasm wasn't required. He wasn't sure he could talk about Sam right now. That's because I'm never here on Sundays. So you're not here now? Obviously. Amber rolled her eyes. So is your clone going to get in line or just stand there getting in the way? Noel couldn't help himself. He grinned. He'll get in line, just so he doesn't put you out. Nice of him. He's actually a pretty nice guy. Noel stepped back and motioned for Amber to go ahead of him. He should give you lessons. Amber winked at Noel as she passed him. Noel followed Amber through the line, grabbing some of this and some of that. He had no idea what he was putting on his tray. He was already distracted by what had happened to Sam. Plus, he was trying to puzzle out what he'd seen by the trees. And now Amber was befuddling him. He'd only recently figured out he might like her. And they'd gone on their first date the night before. It had been good, but today kind of wiped the date from his mind. Should I have called her by now? It would have been nice, Amber said. What? You just said. Should I have called her by now? I did. You did. I, I, I said that bit wrong, but whatever. Uh, I did? You did. She gave him a sideways glance. That had to be evidence of his whacked out mental state. Noel decided maybe he should stop thinking completely. Finding himself at a big round table covered in crumbs and smeared with something red, Noel sat down. He stared at the med red smear. Surely not blood. Must have been ketchup. Why did he have blood on his brain? 
Noel glanced at Amber to make sure he hadn't said that out loud. Apparently not. She was putting past. She was putting blue cheese dressing on a big salad. The cafeteria was about a third full. Conversations were muted and silverware or dish face-offs were intermittent. Outside the wall-to-wall windows, the quad was emptying. The sun was dipping behind the tops of the trees where Noel thought he'd seen... Nothing. I saw nothing, he told himself. Noel looked at his tray. He blinked. Somehow he'd managed to get... Oh god, what is that? So a kraut. <laughs> Somehow he'd managed to get beets, mashed potatoes, three dinner rolls without butter, two dill pickles, and three types of pie. Are you pregnant? Amber was eyeing his tray too. Apparently, Noel picked up a spoon, realising he hadn't got a fork. He dug into the mashed potatoes, as if all was right in the world. He noticed that the cafeteria smelled like beef stew. What was that? What was... What? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Was that the entree he missed? I think that's how you'd pronounce that. Um, Amber chewed and then put down her fork. I'm sorry about earlier. For once, her words were free of sarcasm. Earlier? When I told you about sound, I shouldn't have dropped it on you the way I did. Noel grabbed his glass and took a drink of what was in it to wash down the gluey mashed potatoes. He discovered he'd gotten some sweet iced tea. He hated sweet iced tea. It's okay. Amber put her hand on Noel's arm. No, it's not. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realise how you two were so close. Noel shot a look at her. Was she being sarcastic again? No. Judging from the little crimp between her brows, she was concerned. We're not that. Noel began. Then he realised that, yeah, he was pretty close to Sam. They'd started out as a complete mismatch, assigned to work with each other. Noel was rushing his fraternity. Sam with, lived with his parents. Noel was cool. Sam seemed to go out of his way not to be cool, so screamed his almost military haircut, his crisply ironed shirts, thanks to Molly, and that legal briefcase he usually carried instead of a backpack. You're not, Amber said. Noel shook his head. Yeah, I guess we've gotten sort of close. He's kind of a strange dude, but he's smart and he's funny. He's a nice guy. Like you, Amber said. Noel frowned at her. He stood up so abruptly, his knee hit the table and all the dishes rattled on the trays. His tea sloshed. I've got to go. Amber looked up at him. It's like deja vu. Huh? She waved him away. Call me when you find your brain. Okay. Noel strode away from the table and dumped his tray in the return area. The uneaten food earned him a stern glance from one of the round women with the hairnets who worked in the cafeteria. He didn't care. He just had to... What was that? Noel stopped just outside of the doors of the cafeteria and stared down the hall. He looked the other way too, and then he turned to look behind him. He rubbed his eyes and checked the area again. Nothing was out of the ordinary. Dirty beige floor pale yellow walls, posters vying for space on an overcrowded bulletin board that ran along the wall, a few students strolling in and out of the cafeteria. Nothing to see here, folks. Yeah? So, why was Noel sure he had spotted something big and black flutter around the corner at the end of the hall? And what was that noise? Noel tilted his head and listened. It sounded like a rhythmic rustling, a sort of whispery sound like, well, like wet feathers being dragged along the floor. Noel trotted out of the cafeteria building, stopped, bent over, and took a couple big breaths of fresh air outside. You okay? No? Noel looked up. One of his frat brothers, Steve, stood at the bottom of the stairs, his arm draped around a pretty red-haired girl. Yeah, I'm fine. You say so, Steve said. Noel lifted a hand, and Steve and the girl wandered off. Noel headed for the frat house. Noel sat on his bed his legs spread out and his hands loosely in his lap. He rolled his head around, listening to his neck crack, and he took several deep breaths. When you're tense, adopt a relaxed posture, loosen your muscles and breathe deeply, his mother taught him when he was little and was really worked up about something. Tell your body how you feel, and it will come along for the ride. Usually that worked pretty well, but not this time, for some good reason. This situation was a little beyond old school rela relaxation techniques between leaving the cafeteria and getting into his room. 
Noel had seen something, not someone, but something, following him four times. Four times! Something, but what? Four times, Sam had, weird, had, had heard that weird sound, a cross between the sound of the wind and a fluttering noise combined with regularly spaced airy thumps. No matter how many times he tried to tell himself he was hearing some kind of mechanical contraption of some, or some sort of air conditioning or fan unit attached to one of the buildings on campus, he couldn't convince himself of the lie. The truth was that he was hearing the sound of feathers, lots of them, brushing over the ground and grazing the edges of trees and buildings. It might have been easier to believe his lies about the sa sound if he hadn't also seen a mammoth lurching swell of feathers rippling just at the edge of his peripheral vision. Four times he'd seen these sinister forms billowing in, billowing in and out between the trees. Well, seen was a bit of an overstatement. He actually wasn't sure about what his eyes had told him. The word seen implied a direct vision of something. Noel hadn't had that. He'd had this idea of seeing something, but the more he kicked around the idea, the more he became convinced he had seen something. Something had toyed with his senses, something just beyond the reach of confident visual surety. Sure, yeah, surety. That something had been massive, black and feathery, and there it was again. A large shape darkened Noel's small west-facing fa window, blotting out of the sinking sun for an instant. Noel only caught it out of the corner of his eye again, but it was there. Noel bent over and put his head in his hands. Oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man. He straightened up. Get a grip, he ordered himself. Taking a deep breath, he looked around his room. Noel might have looked just sloppy enough to be cool, but he liked order in his surroundings. He was a minimalist. His room was soothingly white. The maple furniture had clean lines, though it was lightly stained. The small fridge he used for bottled water and the occasional leftover pizza, if he left it in the main kitchen it was sure to get stolen, was white with sleek lines. The bed was made, if a bit messily, and covered with a plain tan comforter. The rug under the bed was... Sizal? Again, don't know what that, that means, but okay. The floor and all furniture surfaces, uh, and surfaces were clutter-free. The only things on his walls were a few black and white still shots from old movies. Noel's frat brothers kept trying to get him along to hang, uh, hang the frat Greek letters in his room. Noel said he didn't need them to know what frat he was in. That refusal was just one of many that had earned him the nickname No. The black shape passed his window again. Noel ran to the window and pulled the white room darkening shade. A shadow flitted behind the shade, and Noel turned his back on the window. This is just stupid, he crossed to the bed and sat again. Was it? Noel liked to think he was a pretty reasonable guy, but he knew what was going on here, and it wasn't reasonable at all. It was very unreasonable. It was unreasonable, but he was sure it was true. Noel was seeing Sam in the Blackbird costume, and Sam was stalking Noel. Why was Sam stalking Noel? It was obvious, wasn't it? Sam was stalking Noel because he was now the Blackbird, and the Blackbird tortures those who confess their dirty secrets. So first, Sam was going to toy with Noel the same way a bully toyed with his victim, and then Sam was going to kill Noel for being such a horrible person. Noel was sure of it, and that was the worst part. And the worst part was that Noel deserved it. Ooh! <laughs> Sunday nights in the frat house were movie nights, and normally, Noel didn't miss that. Not just because he helped organise the events, but because he enjoyed them. But tonight's movie was a horror flick, with blood. And, <laughs> I love the mention of blood, uh, and Noel wasn't up for it. He begged off, earning himself a shower of popcorn and a chorus of boos and hisses. After a half hour of trying to study, and another half hour of staring at the ceiling, Noel wished he had joined in movie night, but he didn't want to go down now, he was too edgy. Noel's phone rang, and he snatched it up, hoping it was news about Sam. Sam's alright. He is, he thought before he said, hello? He is? It was Amber. Who is? You said, he is, Amber said. He did it again, 
He really needs to just stop saying his thoughts out loud. Wasn't I supposed to call you? Noel asked. You didn't. I know. Jerk. Noel's heart tried to strangle him. He swallowed to push it back into place. Maybe I had a reason, he said. I'm listening. My friend has turned into a big black bird, and he's going to come kill me, Noel thought. <laughs> then he gritted his teeth, waiting for Amber to tell him he'd said it out loud. Are you going for the, uh, obscene phone call technique? She asked. What? You're breathing heavily in my ear. It's not turning me on. <laughs> Are you sure? Maybe there's a delayed reaction. Amber laughed. I'll let you know. Nor grinned. In spite of how shaken he was, talking to Amber put him a little more at ease. I called because you seemed kind of freaked at the calf. Amber said. Um, I was just... Just what? Is it about Sam? Noel gripped the phone so hard his fingers hurt. Uh, yeah. Amber's voice softened. I'm sorry. Thanks. For a few seconds, they were both silent. Maybe you'll find this in your sleep, Amber said. Find what? Your brain. <laughs> Noel grinned again. I'll give it a go and let you know what happens. Be sure you do. Oh, I love Amber. <laughs> I love Amber's character already. When Noel hung up the phone, he tried to convince himself that his thoughts about Sam were just some kind of craziness caused by shock. Maybe Amber was right. Maybe he could go to sleep and find his brain, the sane version of his brain, the one that wasn't being stalked by a friend in a bird suit. It was worth a try. Noel stood and stripped out of his clothes. Like the body-proud Ian, Noel slept in his underwear, but he wore boxer briefs, white, no rubber ducks. Sliding in under wrinkled sheets, that desperately needed a trip to the laundry. Noel took one last look around his room to be sure all was all, all was as it should be. It was. He closed his eyes. At first, sleep wouldn't come. Noel's muscles wouldn't let go. They were so taut they could have been strung on a guitar and plucked. As if they'd been plucked, Noel was sure it, they'd sound dissonant. There was no question he was out of tune. Noel tried closing his eyes. Sleep began to take him, and as soon as it did, images of implausi implausibly sorry, images of implausibly huge wings scraped against his lids. Then he felt gigantic feathers battering against his entire body. He was being pummeled by stiff, elbow-length feathers. He could feel them drub against his skin in an eerie contrast of soft versus hard. How could something as light as feather beat him with such power and force? Fear pushed sleep from his consciousness. His eyes shot open. Flailing for the switch on his nightstand lamp, Noel listened to the thundering pace of his heart. Okay, that was alarming. Was that a dream? No, it couldn't have been a dream because Noel had never fallen asleep. He just started falling asleep. Noel stood up and got a bottle of water from his fridge. Downing half of it, he sat on the edge of his bed and steadied his breathing. It took several minutes, and he tried not to notice his hand was shaking when he took another sip of water. Noel set down the water bottle, then said, get a grip. He lay down once more. Let's try this again, Noel said to the room. He reached over and turned off the light. He closed his eyes, and someone or something opened the door to his room. Noel catapulted from his bed and knocked over his lamp, trying to turn it on. The bulb lit the, sorry, the bulb hit the wood floor and broke. So Noel ran across the room and flipped the wall switch. He was alone. The door to his room was closed, and it was locked. Noel stared at his door. What had just happened? Noel looked around. In spite of how ordinary it looked, his room was suddenly threatening. He needed a weapon. Keeping one eye on the door, Noel crossed to his closet and picked up his aluminium softball bat. Holding it like a club, he sidestepped to the door. He got a tighter grip on the bat, then unlocked the door and threw it open. The hallway was empty. Ominous music wafted up from the first floor. Lots of bass and percussion. Noel looked at his watch. The movie was probably still going. Noel backed into his room and closed the door. Locking it, he leaned against it and ran a hand through his hair. What was going on with him? He looked at his bed. Then he stared at his doorknob. No way he was no way was he going to sleep unless he secured his door better. Feeling a little like the idiot Sam used to say he was, Noel stepped over to his desk, 
grabbed his chair and wedged the top of the back under the doorknob. Good thing he'd opted for a wooden chair instead of the plush one on wheels his mother thought he should get. Once the chair was in place, Noel looked at the shade over the window. The window was locked, right? Still clutching his softball bat, Noel checked his window. Yes, it was locked. Good. Now can you stop acting like a paranoid mental patient? He asked himself. He didn't answer himself because he had no idea if he could stop. It didn't seem to be in his control. Noel stood in the middle of his room for several more minutes. Then he decided there was no way he was going to sleep. So he righted his lamp and went into his closet for a broom, a dustpan and a new bulb. After he cleaned up the broken bulb and put a new one in the lamp, he grabbed his laptop and got in bed with it. He might as well work on a new screenplay he was writing. He'd hoped it would be the script he and Sam would use for their midterm project. Now? Noel shrugged. Who knew what would become of it? but working on it might take his mind off his sanity, or make him sleepy. Whichever came first would be fine with him. It only took an hour for Noel to start nodding off. Encouraged by the silence, not just in his room, but in the frat house as a whole, Noel set aside his laptop, made sure his baseball bat was leaning handily against the side of his bed, and switched off his lamp. He immediately switched it back on. Was that a shadow he saw right as the light was going out? He scanned the room. Nothing, of course. Noel decided he needed a flashlight. His lamp may not survive the night if he kept lunging for it. Opening his nightstand drawer, Noel got out the flashlight he kept there for power outages. It was amazing how often one of his frat brothers overloaded the circuits and blew the breaker. Setting the flashlight on the nightstand, Noel looked around one more time and then gingerly laid his head on the pillow. He remained there a few minutes about as relaxed as the wooden Indian he'd accused Sam of being. And that thought made him stiffen even more. His lungs seemed to have shrunk. They couldn't take in enough air. He tried to blank out his mind. Think of good things, his mum always said when he was little and he'd get upset. Then she'd sing that song she always sang when he needed cheering up. He never had the heart to tell her the song didn't do it for him. He wasn't that fond of rainbows or kittens, but he did like Amber. He'd think about Amber. Amber had freckles, just a few of them. They crossed the bridge of her nose like bird tracks. Noel stiffened again. What? Ixnay on the Erds Bay. Ixnay on the Erds Bay. Yeah, Ixnay on the Erds Bay, of course. Noel t told himself. He tried again. So Amber had these freckles, and she had a matching trail of them across the top of her chest. He noticed them peeking out over the neckline of the white tank shirts Amber liked to wear. He also liked that about her. She stuck with jeans and white shirts. He never met a girl as unconcerned with fashion as she was, but she still managed to look great. Maybe it was the wild, shoulder-length, wavy blonde hair. Noel's eyelids started to droop. Trying not to hold his breath, he reached out and turned off his lamp. He lay still and listened. Nothing. Good. Noel closed his eyes, and the window swept open. Something hit the floor with a thud. Noel grabbed for his flashlight and he ended up knocking it across the room. He heard it clatter against the far wall. Noel seized his bat in the dark with his right hand and felt with his trembling left hand for the light. He managed to turn it on without breaking the bulb. Light flooded the room and revealed nothing. What the hell? Noel yelled. He was sure he'd heard the window open. He knew he'd heard something hit the floor. Did he dream it? He shook his head. No way. It had sounded too real. Crossing to the window, Noel checked the lock again. It was latched. Okay, fine. He'd sleep with a light on. Didn't he tell Ian he could sleep through pretty much anything? And he could, so he would. Noel retrieved his flashlight and set it on the nightstand. He repositioned his bat and he lay down on the bed again. He looked at his watch. It was only 11.25. Could he call Amber? And say what? Want to come over and listen for invisible intruders with me? There was a line he'd never tried before. No true. True? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Noel threw his forearm over his eyes, but kept his eyes open. Why did he push Sam so hard yesterday? Noel rolled over and punched the wind other uh, pillow. This is when you know I need to stop reading. <laughs> um, is this really the time for psychoanalysis? He asked himself. He knew he shouldn't have taken that psychology class this semester. 
He did it because his advisor said psychology was helpful for all writers and filmmakers. He hadn't been prepared for how much it forced him to examine his own actions and motives. But since he didn't want to close his eyes yet, why not ask the hard questions? He'd known Sam was getting pissed off yesterday, but he'd kept needling him. Why? And even more important, why had he enjoyed bullying Christine so much in junior high? What was it about her that brought out that level of cruelty? Because there was no doubt about it. He'd been cruel both in junior high and the day before. What did he get from that? Did it make him feel better about himself? He tried to remember something useful from his Psych 201 lectures. Was it mirroring? No. That was when you acted like someone else. Was it projecting? No. Wasn't that putting your feelings off on someone else? Displacement? Hmm. Getting closer. That was taking out your frustrations and impulses on someone or something less threatening than what's bothering you. Threatening. I, I meant threatening. <laughs> I said it like threatening. Ah, he might be onto something. But he was so tired. Noel's eyes closed and finally he fell asleep. A screeching squeal somewhere between an alarm's buzz and a siren's wail, a sound that barely came in under ear-damaging levels, wrenched Noel from cushy oblivion and hurled him back toward Earth. At the same time, a spine-scouring lightning strike burned an image of the blackbird into Noel's brain, marking Noel's mind like a dreadful brand. Noel fought to find his way back to full consciousness, but he couldn't get all the way there. He was awake enough to know he'd been dragged from sleep, but that was, far, that was as far as he could go. It was like something was holding him in place, clamping him into restraints in a way station between thought and no thought. He felt literally pinned to the bed. He could even feel the stabbing pressure of something sharp digging into his skin at the wrist and ankles. He tried to buck off his assailant, but he couldn't move at all. He was utterly paralysed. He could feel the pressure getting stronger and stronger, pushing him deeper into his mattress. He felt like, some, he, felt like he was being compressed into nothingness. And still, he tried to battle the force above him. He poured every ounce of his will into his muscles, and he grunted and strained to get free. His confinement got worse, not better. Noel suddenly sensed an evil presence hovering over him. No, not hovering, sitting. The presence was sitting on Noel's bed. Sitting on Noel! It was pressing down on him, engulfing him, insinuate, insinuating, sorry, I, I read it as insulating, <laughs> engulfing him, insinuating itself into every part of him. And then, with a flash of light, he was free. He busted loose from his bizarre captivity and awoke so fully that when he opened his eyes, he was completely alert and he had his bat in his hands. That, that was a good thing, because Noel was not alone in his room. A demonic presence of tenebrous feathers were poised above, right above his head. So Noel swung his bat. In the nanosecond he swung, or was it the nanosecond before he swung, uh, the thing above Noel's bed disappeared in an eruption of feathers that spewed throughout the room. Then the feathers vanished into nothingness. It happened so fast, Noel couldn't be sure it happened at all. All he could be sure of, well, though, was that the swing, that he did swing his bat. He knew this because his lamp hit the floor, and another bulb bit the dust. The time span in which Noel had seen the feathered thing was infinitesimal. In, in Wow, there's so many big words. Infinitesimal. There we go. I, I do know I do know that word, but it's it's hard to say when you're just hit with it. Uh, get it? Hit with it? Uh, it wasn't even a second. Noel's room went from sound and havoc to utter silence and stillness in the blink of an eye. And yet, and yet, the image of what Noel had seen in that blink was burned onto his retinas. Because he hadn't just seen feathers, he'd also seen soul-drilling, malevolent yellow eyes and a pointed, threatening beak. Those eyes had locked on to Noel's eyes. The sharp beak had aimed at itself right at Noel's guilty heart. Noel was sure it was the blackbird, leaning over him with malicious intent. This wasn't just a still shot. This was a complete horror film playing out behind his eyeballs 
in the theatre of his own mind. That's a very nice metaphor. Without blood. Sam was right. He didn't need blood to have horror. The creep factor was horrific enough. Noel emitted a sound that was half moan and half laugh. It sounded like the strangled sob of an unhinged man. How strange that in just a few hours, Noel had gone from a well-adjusted college guy to a paranoid mental case. Because he had to be crazy, right? To believe the horror that he and Sam had grafted on the fly had come to life? Noel stood and paced around the room. Adrenaline was still coursing through his system, and he needed to get it out. After three U-shaped passes back and forth around his bed, Noel decided one thing. His room was not big enough for his nervous energy, so Noel strode into his closet and grabbed sweats, a t-shirt, a hoodie, socks and running shoes. By the time Noel stepped into the bright hall, it was eerily silent in the frat house. He checked his watch again. It was almost 1am. Wait a second, where did the last hour and a half go? Had Noel lain in bed thinking about psychology for that long? Or had he been in that incapacitated... Inca <laughs> incapacitated... There we go. Sometimes you need to break down the word. Incapacitated state longer than he thought. I have no idea what that means, uh, honestly. I apologise again. He had no idea. The hammering of his heart was drowning out any rational thought at the moment. Striding down the hall as quietly as possible, Noel darted to the stairs and ran down them without a sound. It wasn't that he cared about waking up his frat brothers. He didn't want to have to explain to anyone what he was doing. He just wanted to get away. As soon as he stepped through the heavy double doors and onto the broad front porch of the frat house, Noel rethought his actions. Did he really want to go running in the dark with this creature hounding him? What if the thing got tired of toying with him and decided to grab him? What if it seized him and took off the way an eagle snatched a rodent? Now that did sound insane. Did he really think the blackbird was going to fly over and steal him from the ground? Even if some frightful rendition of Sam and his costume was coming, over Noel, was coming after Noel, that didn't mean it could fly, did it? Why not? If, en if any of what happened today was possible, then anything is possible. Noel turned and ran back up to his room. He spent the next two hours trying to stay awake. He was too terrified to try and sleep again. So he did push-ups and sit-ups. He listened to music. He played games on his computer. Finally, he started watching a movie. The movie was what did it, what is what did him in. He had to close his laptop and sleep overpowered him. As soon as Noel closed his eyes, the high-pitched, uh, what is that? The high-pitched cater walling sound started again. He tried to cover his ears, but again, he was paralysed. Every time he tried to writhe against whatever, um, whatever force held him down, he had to push through the horror that still played in his head the brutal eyes gazing into the murk of his very essence, the beak like a scythe of judgment cutting through his heart. Oh, I love that. I love this. Um, he's, he's using, or the writer is using very good metaphors and stuff. I, li I like this a lot. In his benumbed consciousness, inky feathered shapes uh, streaked toward him, then retreated over and over. He felt like a fat, helpless worm inching through the dirt. The blackbird was merrily playing with him before plucking him from the ground and swallowing him whole. The sound and the image were tearing him apart from the inside and he still fought. Still, he was held in place, until he wasn't. As before, Noel came back into the land of the living with a crack of radiant light and a gaping silence. As before, he was on his feet immediately. And as before, the evil trespasser disintegrated into oblivion, as if it was never there. Which it clearly wasn't, even though every io iota of Noel's being was arguing that it was. Noel was going to lose his mind if he didn't get out of this room. Once again, Noel opened his door and headed through the frat house. This time, when he got to the porch, he didn't let himself think. He just took off running down the, the brick path leading toward the quad. He had to get away, and that meant running. 
The compass was dead still. Noel couldn't even hear a car in the distance. He wouldn't have been surprised to find out that the campus had been isolated under a glass dome. But no, it was still in the real world. It seemed to be a perfectly normal campus hanging out on Earth. The night sky was black. Clouds must have blown in. Bushes gyrated in a breeze that hadn't been blowing for a, a few hours before. An occasional torn poster or candy bar wrapper skittered over the bricks. The campus was lit by a series of wart um, iron lampposts, which cast a mesh... Uh, oh my gosh, a mesh? I, I don't have a list, I swear. Iron lampposts, which cast a mesh of shadow and light over the concrete and foliage. Noel found it mildly disorienting to look at. He seemed to see a feather in every blade of grass or errant branch. So Noel kept his gaze directed at a spot on the ground, 15 or so feet in front of him to try and keep his focus and also centre his thoughts. He'd been running as fast as he could, as if running for his life. He might have been running for his life. Something was torturing him, relentlessly. How could he escape it? For now, he'd run. Noel turned to look behind him, and his shoe caught a tree root. He tumbled off the path into the bushes, lying on his back, holding a twisted ankle and wincing at the sharp pain that suggested he'd skinned his knees and elbows. Noel threw his head back and shouted, Enough! He closed his eyes, and the horrendous sounds started again. The chilling, feathered entity loomed over him. Noel opened his eyes, and of course, he was alone. Noel fought his way out of the bushes thrashing to his feet. Ignoring the throbbing pain in too many places to catalogue, Noel said, Sam, I'm sorry. Turning in a circle, Noel said it again and again, almost like a ritual. Sam, I'm sorry. Quarter turn. Sam, I'm sorry. Quarter turn. Sam, I'm sorry. Closing his eyes for a fraction of a second, Noel confirmed what he suspected, that his apologies weren't accomplishing anything at all. But he tried one more time. He threw his arms up to the sky and bellowed, Sam, I'm sorry. This got a response. It got him a blinding flashlight beam in the face and a campus cops, are you drunk or high? Noel rolled his eyes and faced the guy. He had dark skin and closely, cro and closely cropped hair. An unimpressive badge was clipped to his belt. Neither, he said. I was having nightmares, so I went for a run. Uh, the campus cop shined his light from Noel's feet to the top of his head. Noel held his arms out away from his body, hands open to show he carried nothing. What's your name? The cop put the light, black, the light back in Noel's eyes. Noel squinted and looked away, frowning at the spots that cavorted across his retinas. But hey, maybe if he was blind, he wouldn't be able to see that blackbird. Even thinking the name made the image reassert itself. Name? The cop repeated. Noel Markham, could you please not shine that right in my eyes? The cop lowered the flashlight beam. Noel couldn't see the cop's face very well, but he didn't look much older than Noel himself. He was much taller than Noel though, and the way he loomed over the scene reminded Noel of, Stop it! He commanded himself. Why are you yelling? The cop asked. I was trying to get something out of my system. The cop whipped the light back into Noel's eyes. Drugs? No, I'm not high. I'm not drunk. I... He hesitated. I did something to piss off a friend, and he's mad at me. I was just... I don't know. The campus cop lowered the flashlight again. For a few minutes, they stood in silence. Noel noticed crickets chirping, which he hadn't heard while he was running. Then the campus cop surprised him. He said, I get that. You want to say you're sorry, but you're a little pissed that he's so pissed. So you're yelling that you're sorry to get that anger out of your system. Noel lifted an eyebrow. Not bad for a campus cop. That's exactly right, he said. Okay, well, do you think you're done yelling? Noel nodded. I can be, yes. Okay. Noel waited to be sure the guy was done with him. The cop gestured down the path with his flashlight. I suggest you keep running. It's a great way to get stuff out of your system. Yeah. Thanks. They nodded at each other, and Noel headed off again. By the time he'd run a mile, the barest hint of pale pink was touching the top of the hills at the edge at the east edge of town. Dawn was coming, and Noel hadn't really slept at all. 
Was he ever going to sleep again? He had to let Sam know he was sorry, some other way than by screaming in the middle of the campus. But how? Noel was running back toward his frat house when he heard footfalls approaching from the left. Slowing, trying not to quake in fear, Noel glanced in the direction of the footfalls. He tried to tell himself it sounded like a person, not a bird, and he was right. Noel, for the first time in hours, Noel relaxed. He didn't relax completely, but he let go of his anxiety to unkink the muscles in his neck and shoulders. Hi, Amber. Amber jogged in place right in front of him. Wearing dark blue sweats and a white t-shirt, she was just starting to work up a sheen of sweat. I've never seen you running in the morning before, Amber said. I don't run in the morning. Ah, so this must be another one of your clones? Noel smiled, and when he realised how good it felt to smile, he smiled wider. Yes. How many do you have? As many as I need for the things I don't do. Amber laughed. Do you want to run with me, Noel's clone? Sure. Why not? Sam wasn't ready. Not even a little, to face his day. He still hadn't come to terms with his night. When they finished running... They ended up at the cafeteria again. <clears throat> uh, we have to stop meeting like this. Amber used the hem of her shirt to wipe sweat from her face. I've never met you here before, she said. That was Noel's other clone. Oh, right, I forgot. The cafeteria doors were just opening. An enticing bacon aroma wafted out through the double doors. Only a few bleary-eyed students were starting to straggle toward the building. Amber put her foot up on the railing alongside the stairs and bent over to stretch. Noel felt sweat trickling down his spine. He closed his eyes for a second and then immediately opened them wide to try and wake himself up. Then he wiped his eyes. They were dry and scratchy. Are you okay? Amber asked. I mean, seriously, you don't look too good. Well, thanks. Amber gave him a half smile. You know what I mean. Your eyes are really red. I haven't slept. All night? Noel shook his head. Anything I can do? Noel studied her. It was funny. Just now, he realised she reminded him a little of Christine, the girl he'd bullied in junior high. She had similar colouring and her mouth was the same shape. He wondered if that's why he never thought of her as pretty until recently. Amber had been in several of his classes both the previous year and this one, and he'd never given her a second glance until a couple days before. Now, he realised he liked her a lot. With like came trust, so he blurted, How would you fix it if you did something really wrong, and it was a long time ago, but then you did it again recently, and you can't apologise to the person you did it to, but you're sorry, and you want to make amends somehow? Amber tilted her head and pursed her lips. Guilt is keeping you awake? Something like that. Amber sat on one of the concrete steps and patted the space next to her. Noel acknowledged a greeting from a friend and sat next to Amber. The concrete was cold and damp. It's nice that you felt that it, no, it's nice that you feel guilt. It shows character. A lot of guys are too stupid to know when they should feel guilty. I might have thought you were one of those. So why did you want to go out with me? I might have thought I was wrong. Noel wasn't so sure she was. Did he feel guilty because he had character or because he didn't want to be murdered by the blackbird? I think guilt is like a weed. Amber lifted her face to the sun, which was starting to climb above the tops of the trees. It's best to pluck it out at the root. So apologise to the first person. The first person I need to apologise to, Noel said. But how does that make amends with the second person? Amber said, it's an energy thing. Yin and yang. Balance the scales in one place and the balance radiates outwards. Noel wasn't so sure about that, but he had to do something. There you are. Noel turned at the sound of a girl's voice. It was Darla and their friend group. She pointed at Amber and said, You weren't where we always meet. Amber jumped up. Sorry, it's his fault. She pointed at Noel and grinned. He stood too. I need a shower. Amber nodded and headed toward her friends. She turned back. Good luck. Thanks. He knew he was going to need it. How in the world was he going to find Christine Wilbur? Noel, co oh wait, wait, this isn't like a like a big prank or something, is it? It isn't like Christine 
getting her own back or something. Oh, that would be... Oh. Oh. <laughs> Prediction. How in the world was he going to find Christine Wilbur? Noel contemplated this question during his much-needed shower, and when he got back in his room, and when he stood at his window, watching people head to class. He'd already decided he was skipping all classes for the day. Now he grabbed his laptop and prepared to find Christine. Looking at his bed longingly, Noel took his laptop to his desk. He was afraid if he even sat in bed, he'd start to fall asleep. A quick internet search hadn't helped. Christine Wilbur wasn't coming up on any searches. She apparently didn't do social media and she hadn't done anything significant enough to get on a search engine's radar. So how could he find her? A couple of Noel's flat bro uh, <laughs> frat brothers had been talking about Sam when Noel had returned to the frat house. Sam was still missing, so finding Christine was the only way for him to be safe again. Or was he just coming unhinged? What if the previous night had only been some simple sleep disorder caused by the shock of the day's news? He no longer felt like he was in shock, so maybe if he tried to sleep now, he'd be okay. He hadn't seen any dark shadows or glimpses of big birds on his way back to the frat house. That was a good sign, wasn't it? Noel closed his eyes just briefly and felt like he could fall asleep sitting up. Okay, that was it. He was going to lie down and go to sleep and forget all about Christine Wilbur and Sam and the Blackbird, since the only injuries he'd sustained in the harrowing hours of the long night were ones he caused himself. He had to conclude that the threat was in his head, and if it was in his head, he could well darn beat it. He could darn well beat it. Resolved, he set aside his laptop and got into bed, fully dressed in jeans and a white t-shirt. He sighed, stretching out. He put his head on the pillow, closed his eyes, and sleep took him right into hell. Ooh, I like that. I like that sentence. That really short, simple sentence. I like that. Right into hell. Ooh. The second Noel's brainwave slowed, the blackbird appeared in a dissonant din of keening and buzzing that was so intense it felt like a physical invasion boring into Noel's ear canal. Diabolical wings leaned over Noel menacingly, menacingly, aiming its beak directly at Noel's right eye. The blackbird bent even closer. Noel knew his eye was closed because he was asleep, but in the dream world, his eyes were open to see the beak move lower and lower. At the same time, the weight ramming down on him got heavier and heavier. Noel's chest was being crushed under the feathered mass. Even though he knew it would do no good, Noel wriggled and jerked himself back and forth, trying to throw off the hideous creature. He concentrated on trying to free his legs, but that just made things worse. His legs started to spasm, and it felt like someone was trying to tear them off his body. The pain in his limbs was excruciating. The sound morphed too. The high-pitched tones abated, only to be replaced by a combination of crackling static and a loud hum, interrupted at regular intervals by a deafening zap sound that reminded Noel of the electric bug zappers his, fa his grandfather kept by his back deck. Only this zap was not designed for mosquitoes. It was tuned to something the size of a pterodactyl. Noel realised that he could no longer breathe. <laughs> the, sorry, that line is just funny. The weight on his chest was flattening his lungs and stopping his heart. He felt like he was being dragged into some other realm, the blackbird's realm. And as he left his world, the world he realised he'd taken for granted all his life, his body began to tingle. The tingle sped up, and they, become, and they became vibrations so fast and powerful, it felt like every cell in his body was palpitating at a jackhammer pace. Faster and faster, his body vibrated, and it began to emit a droning sound. Brrrr. What? <laughs> uh, Noel tried to scream, but he couldn't even use his mouth. He realised he couldn't even feel his mouth or the rest of his body. He wasn't just paralysed, he was numb. And that was left of Noel. Uh, all that was left of Noel was his consciousness. His mind was still functioning fine. In fact, it was functioning too well. It was giving him a relentless rundown on the system-wide failure of his body. Noel's existence 
receded further and further into an inky, feathered oblivion. The noise crescendoed, 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 oh my gosh, <laughs> crescendoed. The pain intensified. Nor was sure he was on the verge of total annihilation. And then it all stopped. Except for a vise grip on his arm, an annoying jostling of his shoulder and the sound of someone yelling, Dude! Noel opened his eyes. Ian let go of his arm and shoulder and backed away from the bed. Dude! He repeated, but at a low volume. Noel realised he was bathed in sweat. His skin felt clammy and his clothes stuck to him. He ached all over. Are you okay? Ian asked. Noel couldn't answer that question, so he just shook his head and then nodded. That should clear things up. Ian, wearing only red boxer shorts covered with charging balls, uh, <laughs> with charging balls, dropped into Noel's desk chair. Noel looked at him. He'd never seen the big guy look so shook up. He'd never seen Ian in his room before either. They only hung out when other frat brothers were around, usually in the main lounge downstairs. How'd you get in here? Noel asked. Ian blinked, then twisted his mouth in a guilty little kid way. Oh, I sort of broke your door. <laughs> Noel looked over to see his door jam splintered and his door hanging on one hinge. Sorry, Ian said. I thought you were dying. Noel returned his gaze to Ian and raised an eyebrow. I've never heard anyone make a sound like that, dude, Ian said. It was loud, but really low, like grunting, sort of like you were trying to crazy, it, like, oh my gosh. It was loud, but really low. We're going to try this again. It was loud, but really low, like grunting, sort of, like you were trying like crazy to scream, but someone had their hand over your mouth. There you go. <laughs> and there... And there were all these thuds and thumps. I thought someone was trying to kill you. So I broke the door to get in. Tears filled Noel's eyes. He was weirdly touched. Then fizzes of terror skirted along his skin. What if he had been dying? What would have happened if Ian hadn't busted into his room to wake him? Would the blackbirds have been able to take Noel to another... What? Dimension? Realm? Level of hell? He realised Ian was waiting for him to say something. Thanks, Ian. I was stuck in a really nasty nightmare. You got me out of it. Ian shrugged. Well, good. It seemed pretty bad. He looked hard at Noel. Are you sure you're okay? Noel nodded. Nothing a hot shower and some food won't solve. He sat up. He tried to ignore the room's spinning sensation that triggered a wave of nausea. Ian stood. Okay. Well... Noel wasn't sure he could stand yet, so he didn't. Sorry about your door, Ian said. I can fix it for you. He strode to the door and looked at it. I just need to get a couple things from the hardware store. You don't need to do that. It's my fault you broke it. Ian shook his head. No, I want to. I like fixing things. It'll take my mind off the makeup test I have later today. I need to pass it so I can keep playing ball. No, um, Noel nodded. Let me know if you need uh, any help with the uh, classwork. Ian looked closely at him, probably to see if Noel was jerking his chain. He wasn't. He might have been the day before, giving the dumb jock a hard time, but not today. Ian nodded. Thanks. He went through the now unguarded opening to Noel's domain. Uh, Ian? Noel called. Yeah? Ian turned. If you had to find someone from your past, like from junior high or something, what would you do? I mean, if they weren't online. Um, I don't know. Do you know their parents? Noel snapped his fingers. That's brilliant. Yes, thanks. Great. Thanks again, Ian, for breaking in. Ian shrugged. Anytime. I hope not, Noel muttered when Ian went back to his own room. Noel stood, and for the second time that day, he headed for the showers. In the shower, he chast... What? What is that word? <laughs> I've never seen that word before. He did something to himself for being so dense. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know that word. I'm sorry. Uh, he knew Christine Wilbur's parents were still in town because her dad owned Wilbur's Eats, a popular greasy spoon diner downtown. Now, could Noel have forgotten that? One of the things he'd often said to Christine when he was bullying her was, so you've eaten everything on your dad's menu a thousand times. What do you, what do you recommend? Noel groaned at the memory and turned the water to cold. He flinched when the icy bite shocked his skin, but he both needed and deserved the jolt. 
it would help him do what he now needed to do. Noel was relieved to find Wilbur's Eats mostly empty when he arrived. Only one silver vinyl booth was taken by an elderly couple picking through scrambled eggs and hash browns. And only one red vinyl stool was occupied by a sleepy looking guy in a janitor's uniform. He was drinking coffee and me methodically, there we go, plowing through a large piece of cherry pie. Lovely. The diner smelled like a diner. A good one. <laughs> the aromas came from the food. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm like a little bit off right now because that line that the diner smell like a diner, it's, it's like saying, oh, that apple is an apple. Um, that apple, taste of apple. Um, the aromas came from the food, a weird but not unpleasant mix of onions, fried chicken, apples and chocolate, and the coffee, not from Greece. Clunking and sizzling sounds came from behind a low divider wall separating the dining room from the kitchen. There was a large pass-through for the food, and next to it hung one of those carousel uh, things to clip orders to. It was empty. A thin woman with limp, dyed blonde hair turned to greet Noel when he entered. Sit wherever you want. She waved a hand and returned to her chore, starting a new pot of coffee. The woman wore pinkish uniform dress and a, and a bright blue apron. Her name tag read Lois. Noel didn't want to sit. He wanted to get on with it. So he approached the counter near an old-fashioned cash register. He shifted from one foot to the other. Lois turned and raised an eyebrow. Did you want takeout? No, thank you. I, um, I need to see Mr. Wilbur. Is he here now? Lois chuckled. Sure he is. He practically lives here now. He does all the cooking. Lois rotated toward the kitchen and shouted, Earl, get out here. Someone's asking for you. Noel clenched his fists. He wasn't looking forward to this conversation. He looked up and watched a very short man push through a swinging door to the right of the food pass-through. No wonder Noel hadn't gotten a glimpse of the man. He was barely five feet tall. And he was thin. That was a surprise. Hello, sir. Noel held out his hand. My name's Noel Markham. Earl Wilbur grinned and shook Noel's hand. Good to meet you. Earl was missing a front tooth, but somehow that added to his friendly smile. Unlike his fair-haired daughter, Earl had brown hair and brown eyes. But Noel could see Christine in the man's face. Or would that be the other way round? Both had bow-shaped mouths, wide cheekbones, and close-set eyes. What can I do for you? Earl Wilbur asked. His manner was defer deferential. Defer deferential. Noel had been thinking to think of a smooth way of bringing up the subject of finding Christine, and he hadn't come up with the thing. So he just burst out with it. Sir, I need to find your daughter, Christine, and I was hoping you could tell me where she is. Earl Wilbur's friendly expression didn't change. He just said, That right? He leaned an elbow on the counter across from Noel. Noel noticed Earl Wilbur's forearm was cross-hatched with little burn scars from short order cooking. And why is that? Earl asked. You sweet on her? Lois asked. Her voice was low and scratchy. Earl laughed and patted her shoulder. Well now, Lois, I expect that's his business. Outside, the sun disappeared so abruptly everyone in the diner turned to look through the picture window. Black storm clouds were tumbling through across the sky. Beneath the clouds, right outside the diner, a huge hunched and feathered form shuffled past. What? Noel did a double take. Had he just seen that, or had he imagined it? He looked around to check if anyone else had seen it. The elderly woman in the booth was looking past the elderly, elderly man's shoulder, her gaze focused on the clouds and her face pinched in what could have been fear or worry. But maybe she just didn't like storms. Whether, she, whether he saw it or made it up, Noel had a feeling he needed to get a move on. Looking back at Christine's dad, Noel said, I'm going to tell you the truth, even though it makes me look, like, really bad. But, he shrugged. I was in junior high with Christine, and I was, well, I was a bully. I wasn't nice to her at all, and I need to tell her how sorry I am that I was so, like, mean to her. Is this one of those make amends things? Lois asked Noel. Not in any, not in any official way, I just need, 
need her to know I'm sorry. Earl Wilbur rubbed his jaw. You're the boy who threw burrs at her? Noel scrunched up his face in pure embarrassment. He looked down. Yeah, that was me. When Earl Wilbur didn't say anything, Noel looked up at the man. He expected to see anger in the man's eyes, but all he saw was compassion. Earl Wilbur held his gaze for several seconds. Noel squirmed, but he didn't break off the connection. He had to face what he'd done. What better way than looking, than looking his victim's father in the eye? Finally, Earl Wilbur said, Okay, I'll tell you where she is. She's such a sweet girl, Lois said. Noel ignored his sudden nausea and accepted the directions Earl Wilbur gave him. Then he went outside, making sure he didn't look up as he hurried to his car. Noel's car wasn't much of a car. Truthfully, it was basically a piece of junk on wheels. It was such a piece of junk, in fact, that Noel never admitted he even owned the car. He kept it at his grandfather's house, and he only drove it when necessary. When the car was built, many, many years before, it had been a cool car. But too many owners, too many miles, too many fender benders, and just plain too much time had turned the car into a barely hanging together collection of rusted red metal and engine parts that only just got managed most of the time. <laughs> to get Noel where he needs to go. Oh my god, that was such a long sentence. I'll read that again, because that probably annoyed you. Uh, but too many owners, too many miles, too many fender benders, and just plain too much time had turned the car into a barely hanging together collection of rusted red metal and engine parts that only just managed most of the time to get Noel where he needed to go. That is a very long sentence. Today he was going to be pushing it. He only had to go about 35 miles, but the small campus where Christine was a sophomore like Noel, was up in the mountains. The school was a music and arts college, according to Christine's dad. The storm clouds were still hanging around and they made Noel feel very, very nervous. Whenever he accidentally glanced up at the sky, he saw feathered wings beating the billowing clouds. He also kept seeing an immense black feathered shape shambling along in the wake of his straining vehicle. Every time that happened, he pushed the accelerator pedal harder, which didn't help at all because he already had it pressed to the floor. Noel's car was struggling, predictably, with the uphill drive. After about, uh, after about 50 minutes, however, Noel arrived at a fancy modern cement archway over a narrow road that led into a small collection of glass and cement sculptural p structures that nearly sang out artsy. As Earl Wilbur had instructed, Noel followed the road to the left as it wove through two inverted triangle-shaped buildings and took Noel right into the parking lot of an asymmetrical four-storey dorm. As soon as Noel turned off his car, thunder rumbled in the not nearly far enough way distance. A big drop of water hit Noel's arm as he got out of the car. Refusing to look around, he trotted toward the dorm, but even without seeing his oppressor, he knew it was there. He could hear the laborious, sorry, the laborious lugging of feathers across the pavement, and he could feel the air currents behind and around him shift as his hunter closed in. Noel was sweating by the time he got inside the dorm. The nausea that had started in the diner had grown and had been, uh, and been joined by a pounding headache. Now Noel was starting to feel lightheaded, he had to hurry. Practically running through a sprawling lounge, his shoulder blades tingling with the sensation of being trapped, Noel glanced at a few girls sprawled on plush sectional sofas, chattering away. Oddly, he realised as he put the lounge behind him that he had no idea what the girls looked like or what they were wearing. He felt like his eyesight was getting blurry. The building smelled like cloves, and it was remarkably quiet for a dorm. Only the faintest hint of a staccato. What is that? Staccato. <laughs> Only the faintest hint of a staccato uh, beat can be heard from a distance. It was a little after 5 p.m., and Earl Wilbur had told Noel that Christine was nearly always in her dorm that time of the day because she ate early before going to practice. Earl didn't say what kind of practice. Noel easily found the room number Earl had given him. Leaning against the wall to steady himself, Noel raised a hand and knocked. 
come in a cheerful musical voice called it sounded like a uh, it sounded a little like Christine but it was too upbeat to be her Noel opened the door looking around the room and froze staring the room had only one person in it a girl and the girl was obviously Christine he might have doubted that if he hadn't just been with Earl Wilbur but this girl had her dad's features if not colouring. Christine was still as blonde and freckled as she'd been in high school, but she still had the slightly crooked teeth he remembered, but otherwise she was a very different Christine Wilbur. Hi, are you looking for Claire? Huh? My roommate. Noel shook his head. He was having trouble staying upright. His legs felt weak, and something pushed against his back and down on his shoulders as if trying to pile him into the floor. And who are you looking for? Christine asked. She twisted her nose in the twitchy way she did when they were in junior high, but she didn't seem to see anything behind Noel. He tried to tell himself for the hundredth time that he was imagining things. When Noel didn't answer, Christine said, I think you have the wrong room. She tilted her head with a sentence question. Christine sat at a school desk similar to Noel's. Um... She had a book open in front of her and she held a plastic container of salad. It was nearly empty. When Noel didn't answer Christine, she looked down and forked up a cucumber. She bit into the cucumber and its distinctive scent spilled the air. So did her crunching sounds. Noel kept staring. Apologies. Uh, Christine Wilbur sat cross-legged on her desk chair and one of her bare feet kept time with music that must have been in her head she wasn't wearing she wasn't yeah she wasn't wearing earbuds she was dressed in a full-length skin-tight light blue leotard christine wilbur wasn't overweight anymore she was obviously as fit as Noel was that wasn't the only way she was different although she still had the same facial features and quirky expressions christine held herself with an air of confidence that made it clear she was a very different girl from the one she'd known in junior high. Noel's mental processes were struggling to keep up with the unexpected information. His neuropathways were announcing, this input does not compute. Do you talk? Christine asked. She hesitated and worked her mouth as if trying to find the right words. Then she said, I'm not being mean or anything, it's just that you're standing there and staring. She clasped her hands together and shrugged. Noel shook his head to try and re reset his circuits. You don't remember me? He asked. That's the first thing you say? Christine laughed. He remembered that laugh. He remembered that laugh, sorry. Uh, he'd only heard it once in junior high, when he'd watched her play with a ferret someone had brought to show and tell. Her laugh was a pleasing trill that made you want to laugh too. She set down her salad. Okay, let's see. She stared at him, then shook her head. No, I don't remember you. Should I? I would. You would what? I'd remember me. If I were you, I mean. Noel pressed his hands to his forehead. Christine shrugged, shrugged again. Why don't you just tell me who you are? Noel blew out air. Okay. A couple girls came down the hall behind Noel. They were singing at the top of their lungs. He waited until they were well past, trying to ignore the fact that they'd been followed by that swishing, thumping sound that told him his feathered uh, nemesis was nearby. He opened his mouth and he found he couldn't get the words out. His eyes filled with tears and he had to swallow. Christine frowned. Hey, are you okay? Noel's eyes got even wetter. She was so nice. I was the guy who bullied you in junior high. He said the words fast, sort of like peeling off of a guilt bandage. Which one? Christine asked. Noel blinked. She shrugged and twitched her nose. The hate on Christine crew was pretty big. I started the shh. Thing, and I threw burrs on you. Noel felt like he was about an inch tall. He could understand why he'd ever thought it was so funny, either when he did it or when he told Sam about it. Oh, that was you? She focused her small blue eyes on him. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Noel Markham. She nodded. I think I remember you. You didn't have all that hair then. You were skinnier too. No muscle. Noel blushed been pretty slight in junior high what made him think he was so great he could make him he could make fun of someone else he wiped his still wet eyes 
Christine stood and skipped across the room toward him so quickly it was like she flew. She was extraordinarily elegant and precise in her movement. Noel stiffened, not sure what she was going to do. She hugged him. This wasn't at all how he thought this would go. At first, Noel just stood there, his arms rigid at his sides. But then the combination of her sincere kindness and the honey-sweet scent of her hair released him from his resistance. He hugged her back, blinking away his tears. Christine let him go and stepped away. She was so close, he could see all her freckles and a few dark flecks in her blue eyes. That wasn't an I forgive you hug, she said. It was a thank you. What? Christine motioned for him to come into the room, and he did, sitting on her roommate's desk chair when Christine pulled it out. She returned to her desk, sat, and rotated her chair to face Noel. Clasping her hands together, she said, I'm not going to tell you this to let you off the hook for bullying, but it looks like you really are sorry. I really am, Noel said sincerely. He was surprised by how truly sorry he was. She nodded, thought for a few seconds, then said haltingly, I'm going to tell you this just because I learned something from it, and I figure maybe I can pass it on. In junior high, my mum was always on my case about everything. I felt like crap about myself. You and the others kept putting me down, which also didn't help. To be honest, I barely remember you, but I remember how bad I felt all the time. Eventually, though, I stopped feeling bad and I got angry. I decided to treat myself well. I liked to dance, and I started dancing to have fun, you know? just alone in my bedroom. But then I started going to a real studio and I found out that I'm actually pretty good at it. When the music swept me up, nothing else mattered. Of course, my mum loved that dancing, helped, um, helped me lose weight, but that wasn't enough to make her happy. I think part of me will always struggle on some level with that. Noel stood, opened his mouth to protest. She came over and waved him off. Don't. It's okay. See? That's the thing, all the bullying forced me to step up and love myself, no matter what I see in the mirror or what people actually say about me. I know my value, I'm actually here on a dance scholarship. So see, sometimes when something bad happens, it leads to something good. Noel nodded. Christine looked directly at him. And I do forgive you, you can let it go, I'm fine. Noel's eyes teared up again. He wiped them with the back of his hand. Christine looked over Noel's shoulder. She patted and squeezed his hand. Then he walked out into the hallway and she closed the door. Noel sagged against the wall. That's when he realised he no longer felt a presence lingering nearby. No more feathers. The hallway was silent. His headache was gone. Noel rolled his head from side to side and shrugged, then realised his shoulders. Oh, oh realised, <laughs> then released his shoulders. His tension was gone too. It was all gone. He felt like he'd just set down a backpack full of bricks. Noel smiled a little and picked his way through the dorm. In the lounge, he waved at the girls. He could see them clearly now. They were dressed in leotards like Christine's. Outside, Noel wasn't surprised to find the sun ploughing its way through the clouds. He closed his eyes and breathed in air scented by the miniature carnations growing in a planter at the edge of the parking area. He hadn't noticed those on the way in. He started towards his car, and his phone rang. Reaching in his pocket, Noel pulled out uh, his phone and answered it. Hello? The first two words spoken into his ear brought Noel to a stop. As he listened, he started grinning. Then he said, I'm on my way. He ran for his car. Uh... What? <laughs> Sam was waiting for Noel in front of the film studies building when Noel got back. Sam! Noel shouted. He ran toward his friend. Sam raised a crutch and waved it in the air, then put it back down when Noel reached him. Noel grabbed Sam and hugged him. As best he could, Sam hugged him back enthusiastically. There's my favourite idiot, Sam said. Where were you? You didn't say. I went. Noel waved the air. It doesn't matter. What happened to you? Sam rolled his eyes. Apparently, I've been hanging around you too long. Idiocy must be catching. Noel smacked <laughs> Sam's shoulder. Ow, hey, wounded guy here. Sam winked. Seriously, I was being dumb. I was walking on the tracks with headphones on.
Dumb is one word for it. Sam laughed. Yeah, right? So I turned around just in time to see the train and I jumped off the tracks, but jumping has never been something I'm good at. So not only did something on the train uh, hit my arm as I leaped, <laughs> he lifted a bandage arm, I lost my balance and fell down the embankment and broke my leg. If I'd had normal sized legs, I probably would have been fine. Noel laughed. You and your legs. Get over it. Sam ignored Noel. I was trying to drag myself back up when I slipped and ended up sliding all the way down into the culvert. Then I passed out. I guess I was pretty well hidden. I never heard anyone calling for me, and no one saw me until early this morning, when my parents came back with a couple cops to search again. Sam punched Noel's arm. I'm so happy to see you, man. Not as happy as I am to see you. Noel realised he meant that. Really meant it. And it, I'm sorry. He wasn't taking any chances. Just because Sam was here didn't mean the blackbird was gone. For what? For being such a jackass about the bullying thing. You're right. It's not funny. Sam waved the air with his crutch again. I was oversensitive about it. It's no big deal. No, Noel said. Being thoughtless is a big deal. Sam shook his head. I won't disagree with that, but I should have thrown stones. I shouldn't have thrown stones at a glass house. Huh? I never answered you when you asked if I had secrets. Noel waited. Sam leaned in. Remember I said I was bullied? Noel nodded. Well, I got revenge on one of my bullies by bullying him right back. I played a really mean joke on him just before freshman year. Jerk, Sam laughed. Back at you. Nah, Noel said. No more jerk clones. What? Noel laughed. Oh, it's a joke between Amber and me. Amber and me, huh? I want to hear about that. Want to grab a pizza? Sure, I'm starving. I haven't eaten since before noon. Why not? Long story. Maybe I'll tell you sometime. The blackbird will make you tell, Sam said. Noel's heart stuttered. But then Sam laughed. That, but then Sam... Oh my gosh, I messed up the last line. Noel's heart stuttered. But then Sam laughed. And that is the end of Blackbird. Story one. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, not the best story, honestly. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't feeling it for much of that. Um, there wasn't much, like, creep factor. Um, there wasn't much ent I mean it some of the parts were pretty funny like I love the consistent joke about the blackbird and like the blood and stuff and Amber was pretty cool I really liked the character of Amber that was really cool um I don't know it just it, it wasn't like a story that that stands out to me right now I, I think a load of other stories are way better but what it means um I think it's got something to do with agony and human feelings again um like, because there have been a lot of stories like that, eh? Like, with, um, with, like, people feeling, uh, like, bad or guilty, like, in this story, or they've done something bad, you know, uh, and then they get punished for it. I have a feeling that, like, agony has something to do with that, and it's, like, human emotions or something. Like, I I'll need to look into it more, obviously, but... I a lot of these stories have kind of the same theme, and I felt like this was similar to 1.35am, maybe not as extreme and as intense, but I think it, 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 it kind of followed the same kind of plot as 1.35am for some of it. Um, one thing I do want to say is, like, I recorded this in, in four parts, um, if you're watching the long video, but, you know Amber... Amber is a name that we've seen before in Room for One More. I, I looked at this um, in a break, and actually Psychic was the one who pointed it out to me. Um, Amber. I'm going to see if I can find it. I really hope I can. But Amber was in Room for One More. She was the person that Stanley had a crush on who worked in the diner. Um, oh, here it is. It's somewhere here. It's somewhere here. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's here. So, Amber... Okay, get, like, this is a mini theory. So, Amber is a name that we've seen before. Where we've seen her before? In Room for One More. Amber is also in this story, Blackbird. And one of the lines that she says is, Do you have room for one more? 
I rest my case. <laughs> like, like that is, that is creepy by, that is the creepiest thing in the story. Um, I really, like, if that was intentional, Scott, that's amazing. <laughs> Can I just say, that's such a cool, such a cool, like, um, I guess Easter egg or cameo or like, such a cool concept that you've put in the story. Um, and it does create a connection between Blackbird and Room for One More. Technically, if Amber is the same person, it means that um, Blackbird comes before Room for One More. Uh, I'd assume because they're in they're in high school or they're in college or whatever. Anyway, that is it for the first story of Blackbird. I will be reading the next one, which I believe is the real Jake or something. The I I really should know the names of the the, the stories. Yeah, the real Jake. Um, I'll be reading the real Jake next. So make sure you stick around for that. Uh, and yeah, I, I will see you then. Goodbye.